Good afternoon. Welcome to Lunch with Books. Um, if you would mind turning your cell phones off at this time, we would appreciate that. Um, some new faces here today. If you're not on our mailing list but would like to be, you can fill out a form over on that table and put it in the box. We'll get you on the email list for upcoming programs. We do have a program during Band Books Week on the uh, graphic novel Mouse. That will be September 20th. I still have a few books left upstairs. If you want to register, you get a free copy as long as you come to the program. If you don't, I will come and get the book back. <laughs> um, this Thursday at 7, the seventh class, it's hard to believe how quickly this has gone by, of our dinosaur program at People's University. It will be uh, the night of the backyard brawl, so I'm sure attendance will be great. <laughs> and, uh, we, we, yeah. and we have a pit professor teaching, how about that? So, yeah. First time ever we've had a pit. Uh, Dr. West will be here to tell us about the end of dinosaurs and the rise of mammals. And then uh, this Saturday, if you're interested in labor history, uh, the Ruther Pollock Labor History Symposium at the First State Capitol. A few seats left. Um, it goes on all day. We have some great speakers from Joe Trotter to Kim Kelly and John Hennon and Ann Lawrence. And Hal Gorby will be leading the tour uh, to the... Uh, yeah, he's, he's filling in for Dr. J, who's under the weather a little bit, but uh, Hal will do a great job. And um, this Tuesday, the 6th, John Clemente, or sorry, not John Clemente, John DeFelice will be here. His book is called The Clemente Spell. Um, so those are the announcements. And before I bring Hal out, uh, I wanted to say a few words about our late director, Dottie Thomas, who passed recently. And um, she, we would not have these programs the way we have them without Dottie. Uh, she wanted to make programming a focus and local history and archives, all those things we have her to thank for. And fought for all she was worth for this library and uh, she will be missed. So we're gonna dedicate the program to you. She, she's, she's the one who hired me, took a chance on me. I had no library background whatsoever, except using libraries, but um, she uh, gave me my start. So uh, let me introduce our first speaker, and I'm going to speak briefly at the end after Hal tells you about the life of a very important figure in Wheeling history. Uh, William Howe Gorby is a teaching associate professor of history and director of undergraduate studies at West Virginia University. He teaches courses on West Virginia Appalachian and American immigration history and is the 2021 recipient of Eberly College's Outstanding Teacher Award. His book, Wheeling's Polonia, that he spoke about here, Reconstructing Polish Community in a West Virginia Steel Town, was published by WVU Press in May 2020. He's consulted on research and script editing for PBS's American Experience documentary, a very fine documentary called The Mind Wars. In 2019, he researched, wrote, and hosted a podcast by Wheeling Heritage Media titled, Henry, The Life and Times of Wheeling's Most Notorious Brewer. And uh, he is a history hero of West Virginia. And his name is Dr. Hal Gorby. Well, it's good to be back, as always. I feel like I was only here like a month, a month or more ago. Uh, but it's nice to get to talk to everybody and to uh, set up a little bit of sort of this week uh, where we're going to be looking at labor history. And obviously, as Sean mentioned on Saturday, uh, I have a lot of great historians coming in uh, to talk about uh, various aspects of labor history in the region uh, and country. Um, a lot of people associate me with Henry because of the podcast, but one of Henry's contemporaries at the time, uh, who's probably just as important, if not more, I would say more important, uh, to the city's history and its development is Augustus Pollock. 
and like dozens and dozens of key individuals during that period of the mid to late 19th century really made Wheeling sort of the place that it was. Uh, this sort of generation of first generation German immigrants like Henry, like Augustus Pollock, Anton Raymond, among many others, uh, play a key role in the city's uh, sort of prosperity, its economic development, and also making Wheeling sort of this very German-centric uh, place as well. Um, and I think Pollock's life really represents all of these things quite well, uh, at the height of Wheeling's industrial uh, prestige, let's say. Um, although he does stand out as an outlier in one key way, and that's why we're talking about him. Uh, this is the era of the robber barons, the Gilded Age. Uh, many historians say we are currently living through a second Gilded Age, which I tend to subscribe to. Uh, it's been going on for a while. Uh, and during this time period, Pollock would be the one distinction amongst Wheeling's captains of industry for his stance on labor unions and uh, his view of his employees. Um, so I want to sort of set the tone for uh, Pollock's life, uh, and then we'll turn it over to Sean to talk about his legacy and some of that uh, legacy with labor. But his life intersects with the German immigrant culture in Wheeling, uh, sort of the rising entrepreneurial success many of the, this generation had. Uh, obviously, his key role in the stogie industry, making it sort of a top industry in Wheeling, and I, I think it's fair to say Pollock emerges as the uh, quintessential figure by the turn of the 20th century. And of course, his variety of civic engagement and, and labor being sort of a key, uh, a key sort of part of that as well. And, and, and let's be honest, Pollock also has good facial hair too, so <laughs> he's kind of sporting a, a soul patch from that time. Um, and Pollock, obviously, his early life sets the tone about this later legacy he has when he's in Wheeling. Uh, he was born in 1830, uh, July of 1830, in the Westphalia region of what uh, is now Germany. The son of Joseph and Bertha Pollock. Uh, he came from largely an agricultural family that was, you know, I would say fairly, doing fairly well at the time. So much so that he was able to attend gymnasium, sort of uh, schooling. And by the age of 17, had already sort of been, I guess we could call it, apprenticed to a commercial house uh, in the region. That early business uh, sort of experience would help him, obviously, throughout his career. Uh, and obviously, he, he has his start in his first few decades working in sort of this sort of commercial uh, business in a variety of different uh, exploits. Like many of the immigrants who come to America, and particularly to Wheeling during the years before the Civil War, they are uh, obviously part of this greater trend of German immigrants leaving after the failed revolutions of 1848. Uh, and Pollock doesn't waste much time, April, <laughs> April of 1849, uh, he uh, leaves and immigrates uh, to the port of Baltimore, which is a key port particularly for German Jewish immigrants, uh, which you know is important to uh, Pollock and his family's uh, heritage as well. There he takes a job with Hamilton, Hamilton and Sons, and eventually starts his own uh, notions, fancy sort of notions, sort of good store uh, there in Baltimore. Uh, he's running it, you know, by the time he's in his early 20s. And by 1854, there had been some other German immigrants who had started in Baltimore, made their way to Wheeling, uh, and Pollock is going to follow this uh, similar trend as well. And in 1854, he relocates to Wheeling the first time. He actually is a very enterprising figure who also is trying to kind of also get businesses started uh, along the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad in the town of Grafton. Uh, Grafton Wheeling, two of the key uh, places along the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. Uh, but by 1860, luckily for all of us, uh, he decides to make his permanent residence here uh, in Wheeling. Although he still maintains a business presence in Grafton for some, for some time period. And so, and I have a few advertisements to show you, but he opens up a commercial notions store that sells a variety of fancy uh, clothing, other types of products, a lot of imported products from Germany uh, and other parts of, uh, of Europe. The, the store was located at 1217 Main Street. I was trying to look earlier. This is roughly near, near where Tourist Bank is located, where the old BB&T was loca is located. So here's a couple of advertisements for Pollock's Notion House. 
uh, giving you a sense of some of the types of things that they are selling. Obviously, he is becoming a very enterprising business owner during the Civil War, so note on the, the, the right-hand side under the ad, revolvers, swords, sabers, and sashes. Um, but he's selling a variety of fancy uh, goods and products, cotton hosiery, German, uh, German clothing, children's carriages, embroidery, hand, uh, handkerchiefs, uh, and a variety of other things. Also helping to supply items at a, at a time when Wheeling was a major city as the capital of this new state of West Virginia that's being formed. Also because of the number of troops that are moving in and out. Pollock uh, was in the right kind of business, let's say, uh, to be a very successful entrepreneur. Uh, in his personal life, he married R Rosalia, Rosalia Weinberg of Baltimore, and they uh, eventually had seven children. During the war, he had also kind of leased out his Grafton properties for the benefit of the Union war effort. He was obviously a, st a strict supporter of the Union. And in 1863, is actually reported as uh, on a list of uh, troops that have been raised from this part of the state. Now, he was a little older at that time. And best, uh, best stories that I've read said he basically uh, served uh, sort of here on the home front and continued to operate his... Uh, his store. Here's another uh, advertisement from uh, a few months after the war is over. Uh, his job, and noting him as an importer and a jobber, that, that is a very sort of common uh, title used for this, this type of business establishment uh, at the time period. But you can see uh, the types of things that they're receiving, cotton uh, gloves, hoop skirts, uh, a variety of other flannel shirts and other types of clothing. This is the era before big department stores, so Somebody who can sort of provide these types of products in bulk, but also provide uh, luxury, fancy items that maybe uh, are not as available. This is a trend we see amongst German, Ju uh, German Jewish merchants uh, in various larger cities in the decades and during the Civil War. So the, and Pollock is not that uh, unusual in that respect. Just a little bit of background on him again. And by 1871, he has become so successful with his notion store that he is able to get into a new area, uh, uh, the stogie business, uh, and opens his Crown Stogies uh, factory uh, along Water Street, uh, sort of near in the wider area where Heritage Port is located today. Nice little West Virginia themed advertisement here from 1880. Obviously, Wheeling has been known as a stogie and cigar production center for many, many years, but Pollock is able to, through his business connections, his hard work ethic, which most people have, you may have heard this, but he, he was noted that he would often work 16 hours a day, uh, was a very hard worker, was often sort of stuck you know, in his shop working late into the night. Uh, and that hard work ethic really helped him uh, prosper as a business entrepreneur. Uh, here's a little bit more of a blown up image of what's on this letterhead up here in the front if you haven't, haven't had a chance to look at it. This is showing the uh, Crown Stogie Cigar Factory on Water Street. You can see the river there. It's a little bit of an artistic rendering, but you can get a, get a little bit of a sense of what, uh, what the factory would have looked like at that time. Roughly from 1216 to 1224 Water Street, if you're roughly wondering where, uh, where this would have been located. <clears throat> And like many of his generation, they are becoming very successful economically really quickly thanks to the Civil War, thanks to the fact that Wheeling's the state capital throughout this whole period, uh, first the restored government of Virginia and later uh, the state of West Virginia. And this is a generation of, of enterprising uh, German immigrants who really want to improve their community and be involved in the, state, the new state uh, as well. So Pollock, like many others, Anton Raymond, Louis, Louis Stifel, even Henry to a certain extent, are involved in not only a number of different business ventures, but also involved in local government, local boards. Uh, Pollock will serve in a number of investments on other businesses throughout Wheeling in the area. He'll serve on a number of corporate boards and even be president for a period of time, uh, be in civic groups. They always wanted him to get into politics. But uh, he, he, the only elected role I've ever seen him hold was he was on the Board of Education uh, here in Ohio County. Uh, 
Uh, he was drafted a couple times to be a member of the House of Delegates to run for election, but he would always uh, sort of turn, turn it down. Uh, so one of his key types of involvement, of course, was on corporate boards. Um, and one of those key ones was obviously his early involvement with the German Bank of Wheeling. You can see in the bottom uh, left up there that at this time he is the president of the German Bank, uh, which is becoming one of the larger and fastest growing banks because it's pulling the resources of all of these very uh, successful German immigrants. And you can see including people like Anton Raymond, John Osterling, uh, John Hoffman, among many, uh, many others. And Pollock, you know, often gets kind of maybe forgotten in this sort of class of sort of the top sort of echelon of, of Wheeling's uh, sort of elite business and political figures during this time period. But he is actively involved in a number of entities, as I mentioned, with the German bank. He's also director for a period of time of the German fire insurance company, which you can see uh, an ad here in the top, uh, the top right. Um, and he's invested and involved in a number of other business enterprises. He's president of the West Virginia Tobacco Company and on their board for many years. Uh, for a period of time was the director of the Aetna Standard Iron and Nail Company, a prominent uh, uh, sort of iron and steel company in the region, among many others. Uh, one of his earliest financial investments was actually to help finance a German newspaper during the time of the Civil War and existed for some years afterward. I've never seen any extant copies of it, however, but this is uh, Der Patriot, uh, which was a, a sort of German language publication that he helped finance during, during the war. As I mentioned, he's a, he's a member of the Board of Education for a period of time after the Civil War, and that's his only ever elected uh, position. Uh, he's, he's on it for a few years, not exactly, it's a little unclear how, whenever he gets off of it. Kind of gets off of it roughly around the time his stogie business is starting. He was also involved as a trustee for Lin Lindsley Academy for many years, particularly later in life, also with uh, other educational endeavors throughout the county. Uh, and he was a supporter of a variety of musical groups. He, he loved classical music. Uh, he obviously was a supporter of the variety of German singing societies as well uh, that existed in town at the time as well. Uh, this is the era when the Republican Party is dominant in Wheeling and in the, in the country, and particularly in this industrial belt of the United States. And Pollock is a member of the Republican Party in politics. He is so prominent that he often was uh, sort of involved in state Republican conventions in Wheeling, Parkersburg, and other places. And in 1888, he was a presidential elector for uh, Benjamin Harrison and then heavily involved in Harrison's unsuccessful re-election campaign in 1892. Uh, he was a strict supporter, a supporter of the protective tariff, which was kind of the, uh, you know, the thing if you want to get students really bored about politics in the late 19th century is tell them about how, how vicious people and angry people got about the protective tariff. Uh, but for people like Pollock and other uh, manufacturers, it was vital to uh, the maintaining of American industry, and Pollock was a, was a big supporter of it. However, in politics, he was often known as being somewhat of an outlier. He didn't really follow the orthodoxy of the Republican Party. He would often break from it on a number of issues, and you can probably guess what the main one being, the view of labor unions. So here we have an advertisement during the 1888 presidential election, specifically Pollock targeting working people uh, to come listen to issues of the campaign that, that cycle. Um, and, you know, Pollock was often used as an intermediary between, let's say, the sort of uh, upper echelon business uh, class of Wheeling and uh, uh, many working class Germans who were still at this time uh, strict followers of the Republican Party. Um, Pollock at various times would often get criticized, uh, mostly in poli politi for political reasons, by the Wheeling Register, the Democratic uh, newspaper in town. And this is an, edit, uh, an unnamed editorial from someone named Seed Clipping, which sounds like a tobacco worker to me. Uh, sort of responding to a register attack on Pollock because of his support for uh, what they claimed were various political uh, issues. And I think this really summarizes his political viewpoints and how that relates to this issue of labor. It says, he believes in making laws that will be a benefit to the working man as well as himself. That is a protective tariff. 
In conclusion, allow me to add, he is the same Augustus Pollock that declined one or two propositions to reduce cigar makers' wages with the remark that wages were low enough as they were. This is the same Pollock that hires none but union workmen and pays nights of labor wages. Don't say now one of his hands wrote this. They did not. The writer was discharged of Pollock some time ago, but he believes in justice where justice is due. Justice where justice is due is a nice way to summarize Pollock's view of his uh, employees. Here's another of uh, Pollock's cigar factories. Can anybody tell where this location is? This building is still around. Yeah, not too far away from where we are right now, actually. Uh, this is the Ott High School uh, building that's kind of off the exit as you're getting, coming off the uh, Route 2, coming into downtown Wheeling. You kind of pass it, on, it's on the left-hand side there. That was another one of Pollock's, uh, Pollock's establishments for a period of time. And I think that last quote really sums up Pollock's views quite well in this sort of uh, history of fair dealing and justice with his employees was something that even though he would often get criticized you know, by uh, others, others in Wheeling and outside, he was very, uh, very fair and well known amongst working people for being fair. Um, and his labor relations at his factories, which employed at its height hundreds, maybe five, six hundred employees, uh, was out of the norm of Wheeling. I, I think I can say pretty demonstratively, this is a period of the height of labor strikes in Wheeling's history in all industries, and Pollock really is at the top of having good, cordial relationships, actually encouraging his employees to be a member of a union, seeing that as a, an effective way to actually negotiate issues that go on between the owner and, uh, uh, and his operator. And I could give you numbers of examples of this during this period when the, all, many of the other elite leaders in Wheeling are trying to deal with constant labor unrest in the steel industry, uh, 1885 a nail strike, for example, in the coal industry, in glass, and some of the other uh, industries. So I'll give you a couple of examples. In April of 1883, Pollock granted his workers a 25 cent raise on every thousand stogies that they would produce. It's a pretty sizable raise for the time period. The press alleged that this was to put down a threatened strike, but when uh, asked about it, workers and Pollock himself made it clear that that really wasn't the issue. And what the problem was that they had basically, he had been sourcing a certain kind of tobacco for a while where the average sort of stogie roller on each leaf could get maybe two or three wrappers out of it. This newer tobacco was not as good and they could get one. So Pollock thought it's, being, it's going to make it harder on them to make enough stogies to the same level. So to help uh, compensate them for that harder work they're going to put into it, I'm going to raise, I'm going to raise their wages accordingly. Um, that's very progressive for the, for the time period. But most business owners, if that happened, they just say, well, tough. Had to pay more to source the product. That's going to come out of you. Or they would have raised the price of the product and passed it on. Um, and as noted by the Wheeling Intelligencer, quote, the workmen at Mr. Pollock's factory never had any cause of complaint. Wages were always justly and liberally adjusted, and the men felt that their interests were safe in the hands of their employers. This is the height of industrial tension in the country. I cannot downplay that enough. You know, homestead strike, you know, a few years later, a uh, variety of strikes happening, happening in the area. So. This really says a lot about the different type of relationship he has with his employees. Whether we would call it paternalistic, there's a certain element uh, there, but not to the extent that we would use that term, let's say, for talking about coal operators in the southern part of West Virginia. Um, and Pollock, there's often stories of his employees getting him presents, so particularly at Christmas time uh, in 1893. His uh, workers put together money and bought him a very fancy work chair to keep in that office that he's working in 16 hours a day. And Pollock also involved himself in the wider affairs of trying to deal with all of these constant lockouts and strikes. If you look at the Wheeling Press during this period of time, you can pretty much find a strike happening at almost any given time. And Pollock, as seen in his support of labor, he's also a very strong advocate of labor arbitration as a way to mediate these types of disputes. 
Uh, and a great example of this happens in early 1888 when Pollock is asked to help mediate a lockout and wage dispute with workers at the Central Glass Works in East Wheeling that's owned by another prominent captain of industry, Nathan Scott, who eventually becomes a U.S. Senator for, from West Virginia. The issue was complex in a variety of ways and under these arbitration boards, which was something in different industries they were trying to do to mediate strikes at this time, the company got a representative, an attorney. The union sent an attorney from Pittsburgh and basically the deciding vote would be sort of pick somebody from the community who had a good standing. And the only person they could think of picking was Augustus Pollock, who both sides agreed would be fair uh, and was known for his fairness. Basically, he's the umpire. He's referred as the umpire, and when they finally issue their final report after hearing both sides, it's Pollock that gives, uh, gives the ruling. I think you can probably guess I'm using this example. He probably gave this to the workers, which he did. Pollock uh, was able to very effectively wade through the wage dispute itself and some of the issues with that. Uh, but also to note that the issue at hand was a lot bigger than just a wage dispute. He said, quote, I'm entirely convinced that the issue turns rather upon its moral status than on its legal phase. Meaning the moral status of how the employer and the employees view each other, how they ex set their terms of how they're going to work and how they're going to treat their employees. Uh, that, that comes out in a lot of this opinion. Um, and basically what had happened was in July 1st, 1887, there had been kind of a negotiated wage increase uh, that was not on paper, which is kind of a questionable way to do an agreement. The workers had believed that the company's ownership had agreed to the wage increase, particularly to help uh, give them a raise during the hot summer months of July, August, and into September when uh, it was very, very difficult to work in a glass factory. There was no formal written contract, so this kind of led the company to claim that since they weren't a part of the Manufacturers Association, that there really wasn't a wage increase that had been guaranteed. Um, basically saying we didn't have a conversation formally about that. Pollock and the others, after hearing on both sides, Pollock agreed that the workers had uh, bargained in good faith, uh, that their demands were not that outrageous. Uh, and he also, in his opinion, criticized both sides, saying that uh, in the future, to avoid future strikes, uh, you and other employers would be best served to have formal written contracts and probably, like Pollock, have collective bargaining agreements. This is a manufacturer telling other manufacturers that they should negotiate with a labor union and have a collective bargaining agreement in 1888. Just think about that for a second. It's Andrew Carnegie is not going to be doing this. John D. Rockefeller is not going to be doing this. And I don't want to call it any wheeling business owners, but there's a lot of them that wouldn't have done this either. Nathan Scott sure wouldn't have, and many others wouldn't have. So this is very, very unusual for the time. Lastly, of course, Pollock is a key figure in German wheeling. Um, He's involved in the years after the war in a variety of efforts to really tie this German community together and show its political muscle, so to speak. Um, so as you can see on your screen here, this is a sort of, I don't want to call it a manifesto, but it was sort of a, a statement of purpose, let's say, that was published in the newspaper with the onslaught of the hostilities that we now know as the Franco-Prussian War of 1870-71. Uh, and as you can see here, the secretary at this meeting was Augustus Pollock, and it is signed by many George Franzheim, John Osterling, Anton Raymond, uh, and many, many others. This large German population uh, had been mobilized during the war, had become engaged politically in local, state, and even national politics, and they are still connected to their homeland. So many, uh, at many times throughout the late 19th century, you see Pollock come up involved in issues dealing with uh, the home country of Germany. Uh, he was a very strong supporter of Germany uh, in many ways. It's probably uh, best that he, he, he passed away before the sort of negative anti-German sentiments of the World War I period. Uh, but this is definitely re uh, representative of a time when Wheeling was a very sort of German place. In July of 1870, he was involved in a mass meeting at the Turner Hall in North Wheeling. Somebody, I think I talked about that. 
And he was also involved in sharing efforts to raise funds for widows and children affected by uh, the war uh, in Europe as well. And in 1871, upon Germany's success in the war, uh, he was one of the key organizers in the German peace celebration. Uh, it's more of a German victory celebration, but we'll, we'll, that's what it was called. Uh, which at the time was noted as, at that point, the largest parade event in Wheeling's history. Obviously surpassed years later by many others. And of course, the best example of his sort of leadership in German wheeling, of course, comes in 1885 with the Sangerfest Festival. Uh, this was the second of the three major ones that were held during this period of Pollock's life, roughly. Uh, Pollock presided over the 1885 event, the second one. Um, and this built off of his earlier support, obviously, for uh, classical music and, of course, the various German singing societies. This is a, an advertisement, uh, thanks to the Ogilvy Institute, showing uh, sort of uh, all the different acts that would be here from July 20th, 23rd, 1885. Uh, this was located at the Alhambra Palace Hall, which was on 33rd Street. It was a big roller rink that existed at the time that could uh, supposedly hold 4,000 people. Um, and it was a major venue. They had a monster parade with p uh, large festivities at the, at the fairgrounds as well. And in Pollock's keynote address, he noted very uh, strongly sort of the ties between that sort of civic identity he had tried to foster along with, uh, of course, uh, his strong ties to his German-American heritage uh, as well. <clears throat> and we'll, we'll end with this image. This is obviously after he passed, but this is just showing uh, his employees uh, in, in 1914. Um, so, uh, as I said, Pollock during his life was an outlier in Gilded Age wheeling by far for people of his uh, social class and ranking. Uh, and this is probably explains why he's, I believe, the only business owner that the labor union ever built a monument. And with that, we will transition to my friend, Sean Duff. Okay, thanks, Al. Um, just curious, I, I have my tie on today with uh, Mr. Pollock. I had made a couple years ago. How many are uh, members of the Ohio Valley Trades and Labor Assembly? Anyone here? Anyone here is, I know one person introduced herself. Is there any other descendant of Mr. Pollock? Just curious. Okay. Well, uh, just to build on what, what uh, Hal said, because Mr. Pollock uh, provided an example in a period of history that was not conducive to these types of examples of the fact that you could be a successful businessman and make a lot of money and still treat your employees like human beings and not commodities. And this, as uh, Hal already mentioned, was the Gilded Age. So the term robber baron is relevant. What was a robber baron? Well, as the dictionary reminds us, a person who's become rich through ruthless and unscrupulous business practices. It usually refers to some 19th century figures that we'll discuss here in a minute. This is a cartoon by Kepler showing you the bloated giants of industry and how they control uh, the seat of power in Washington. Uh, so who were these robber barons? Well, Hal already mentioned this one, Mr. Carnegie, and his partner, Henry Clay Frick, the two gentlemen mostly responsible for why you're not now sitting in a Carnegie library here in Wheeling. Um, Jay Gould, Mr. Rockefeller, the ruthless J.P. Morgan, Cornelius Vanderbilt, there were many I could go on and on, and there was this guy, <laughs> and that guy. I just put those last two in there to see if you're still awake. Uh, but, uh, yeah, arguably there. So, Robert Barnes. These are the types of business owners America's used to. and. Um, Hal also mentioned it was a period of strikes and boycotts, so labor was very active. Here are just some of the major national uh, strikes during that period of time.
from 1871 until 1906 when Mr. Pollock was essentially, until he passed, in charge of his uh, uh, Stogie Company. You see there the Homestead Strike, the uh, Carnegie Frick, U.S. Steel, there was a coal strike, and a cigar maker strike of 1877. Well, locally, as Hal also mentioned, you had the nail strike, you had the Cooper's Union, you had boycotts from uh, grocer's boycott, you had the scab beer boycott, sad one, and you have the uh, Wheeling Railway strike, the Ben-Hur flower boycott. So lots of activity by the Ohio Valley Trades and Labor Assembly and all of their the locals here in Wheeling during that same period. And, but what about our man, Mr. Pollock? How many strikes did Mr. Pollock have? Zero. Yes, zilch, zip, <laughs> nada, <laughs> squad douche. <laughs> and um, despite all that, his motto was work wins. And he did put out a product, product, a quality product. And uh, as Cranmer said in his history of wheeling, uh, Mr. Pollock was a believer in the dignity of toilers. Think of that. A believer in the dignity of toilers. While other robber barons were treating human beings like possessions, uh, he believed in their dignity. So, no small feat. Um, he died April 23, 1906, largely because of uh, asthma, acute asthma attack. He was 75 years old. He died in his sleep. We all should be so lucky. Uh, surrounded by family, his wife, some of his daughter, most of his daughters, one and his son was out of town at the time when he passed. They closed his factory. Hal showed you this picture of the, just to give you an idea. And, um, the Garfield local. Now, if you really want to judge a person who owns a business, get the union's opinion. Yeah. And that's what I look at. And, and we'll, it gets better. But this is a resolution they passed after his death. And uh, they said, Mr. Pollock's clear insight, unselfish judgment, and kind heart enabled him to make real that which for other good men is an ideal, the harmonious cooperation of capital, enterprise, and labor. He encouraged the organized union of labor. He paid the highest wages, sometimes increasing them without request, as Hal mentioned. And he responded to every call for aid. In his business career of a half century, there was never a strike, a lockout, or a misunderstanding. Only a short time ago, he declined to part with his business, and we'll get to more on this later. Although offered a high price, because uh, even though he needed a rest, because he could not be assured that it would be continued upon his own just and humane principles. More on that in a minute. It was unanimously resolved uh, by the Garfield to attend the funeral in a body, so it would be the largest turnout of stogie makers in the history of the Union. And then the Ohio Valley Trades and, uh, Ohio Valley Trades Assembly called a special meeting to arrange for the attendance of every local union represented in their body, which was pretty much all of them. He is buried at so it's a massive funeral. He was buried at Greenwood. This is how his grave looked Saturday. Um, there's a color picture of it. Here's what I was talking about. In January of 1906, so before he died, and he's trying to sell the factory because he wants to retire, uh, a gentleman from Pittsburgh, I think his name was Hamilton, offered a half a million dollars, which is a large sum, but he would not accept the uh, union labor provision and the no reduction of wages provision. So Pollock said no. But what most endeared him to labor was what happened after his death. And they got to read his union, I mean his will. In his will, he left $2,000 to be invested, uh, the interest to be used to educate a working man's son each year at Lindsay School. So it was uh, specifically a descent, someone descended from the industrial population. Uh, I, I wrote to the current uh, head of the school, Mr. Zimmerman, and he said that is not still in existence, but they do things, they do it much differently now, and they, have, they don't have records from that period, but it was a thing. And he also gave money for the education of the masses to the principles and purposes of trade unionism by lectures and literature. It's kind of what we're doing here today, but he, he didn't pay for this, but. <laughs> 
but in a way he did. And um, he also left money to the uh, National Stogie Makers League. Left money to a union. So um, this is a picture that we think is from the 1906 Songer Fest. So Hal mentioned that he was president of the 1885. And the sign in German strung across the street by Stone Thomas says, Wo ist der König, which means where is the king? This could be in honor, because he died a few months before the Songer Fest in 1906, uh, of Mr. Pollock, president of Crown Stogies, where is the king? Or it could refer to the fact that uh, he led in wheeling uh, ceremonies commemorative of the death of Emperor Wilhelm of Germany. So this could be from 1888, though I tend to think it's, it's from 1906 because the intelligencer had a picture in the paper of Stone and Thomas and looked exactly like that, although you couldn't see that banner, unfortunately, which would have proved it. So, so beloved was Mr. Pollock that George Kaiser of Garfield National Stogie Makers League uh, came up with the idea that, that the Union should build a monument for him. And they asked the Ohio, Ohio Valley Trades and Labor Assembly to form a committee, which they did. They were so moved by the provisions in his will, they started a push for a monument in, in May of 1906. And that's a clipping from the Wheeling Majority, sort of launching. And, uh, in 1907, they sent a letter to all the local unions which said that Pollock was one of labor's truest, noblest, most loyal, and patriotic friends. In the person of Augustus Pollock, we enjoyed the influence of one whose object in life's work was desire to witness the day when capital and labor would sit at the same table and clasp hands in the observation of true equality and brotherhood. Can you imagine? They're saying that about a business owner. They called him, the, this is when they called him the George Washington of uh, labor's cause. And they said his devotion to the interests of employees was true and affectionate as a mother's love for her child. That may have gone a little far, but that's what they said. It took him 10 years to raise the money. Why? Well, a working person at that time did not make a lot of money, so they, they only had small donations and they only wanted union donations at first. They came up with the idea of selling $1 certificates. It took them 10 years. So by 1916, they'd raised $7,000. That's a lot of money for back then. And they raised it from six international unions, 750 locals, and 3,000 individuals. The largest contribution from any individual was not more than $100, and the smallest was 25 cents. Uh, a Chicago artist named Ab Jorbson and architect Frederick Ferris designed the, the monument. The Kreutzer firm of Wheeling are the ones who built it. And it's originally placed at the city building, the courthouse. And it was 37 feet tall, Corinthian column topped by an eagle, above a 15 foot square base, 60,000 pounds of granite. Two workers are depicted shaking hands, and the inscription reads erected by trade union members of the United States in memory of Augustus Pollock whose business life and actions were always in sympathy with organized labor. And I would argue it is the first and still the only monument like that built by labor for a business owner. There was a big parade in May when they dedicated it. There were brass bands, which provides an opportunity for me to remind you, uh, where did my brass band go? Well, anyway, on the 13th, we're having uh, the coronet uh, history of cornet bands. There were dozens of them here in the Ohio Valley, like the ones you see depicted here. And we'll have the Wheeling Symphony Orchestra on the go brass quintet here. So they'll play some music on the 13th. Uh, there were 10,000 men, women, and children at, his, uh, at the uh, dedication of the monument. And uh, they crowded all around the city building at the time. Young Mr. Corcoran here was, had the privilege, uh, his father was on the committee from the Trades and Labor Assembly, to pull off the bail and unveil the monument. Uh, the total cost reported in the newspaper was $8,433 in the end and 10 cents, 
which is $225,604 in 2022. So, pretty expensive monument. Lewis Leonard was the president of the Ohio Valley Trades and Labor Assembly, and he said about uh, Mr. Pollock, and I thought his, he was a little more eloquent than Mr. Ty, who also gave a speech, but such a man was Augustus Pollock, who not only attained a higher position in the commercial, financial, and industrial life of the community, but also reached a position where he was known and respected as being a humanitarian in the strictest sense of the word. His work were legion, and the sweet smelling incense, the sweet smelling incense of his love for his fellow man will shed its fragrance as long as civilization exists in the valley and where he spent his life and where he gave himself unselfishly for the betterment of society particularly for the men and women he employed. This is the monument in its full glory, 1949, near the city building. When that was raised, 1956, they moved it to 827 Main, where most of us are familiar seeing it for many years, near the List House and the Fort Henry Bridge. There's another image. Here it is from Saturday down to its new home since 2013 at Heritage Port when uh, the Ohio Valley Trades and Labor Assembly rededicated the monument along with Wheeling Heritage. Uh, there is now a interpretive plaque, which is helpful down there. Uh, so what happened after uh, all this? It's sort of the, the uh, epilogue. Um, well, as you can see here, the heirs, that is the Pollock family, did continue the business. They were unable to sell it per his will to anyone who would respect union labor and no reduction of wages. So they continued to run it. Um, and here's a little article that went around the country. This happens to come from the Tacoma Times. It says, the lady girl strikers uh, thought the girl millionaire. They're referring to Gussie Pollock, his daughter, who was running the company at the time. And it's a little condescending, but it gives you the idea that there was a strike now, yeah? And the, the tobacco strippers, these ladies, uh, were involved in they wanted to raise. And then in uh, 1913, there's a, another strike. Employees wanted 50 cents more on the thousand stogies they made. So we're starting to get some trouble. And a tornado hit Wheeling in 1925 which damaged the, uh, the factory up here, the, the side of it, on the, the other side of what's still standing. And uh, in 1939, Block Brothers Tobacco acquired uh, half of, I'm uh, sorry, acquired Pollock's company because the flood of 1938 had washed out the Water Street factory. Uh, they started then in 1988, they were owned by National Cigar Company, which had bought Marsh, and Marsh had owned Pollock. Uh, they still make the Marsh brand, as you can see from their website, but they uh, not Pollock. This is Mr. Bill Carney portraying Pollock for the Greenwood Cemetery tour back in 1991. He did a lot of research. That was useful. There he is talking to the people. And when I joined the uh, Hall of Fame board in 19, er, 2013, not 1913. <laughs> uh, I, I couldn't believe that he wasn't already in the Hall of Fame, but that allowed me to, to uh, propose nominating. And so he was inducted in 2013, and there I am with the uh, president of the Ohio Valley Trades and Labor Assembly, Mr. Ellis. And there's Augustus Black, which you can see down at uh, West Bank of the Arena. And uh, that's it. Reminder that we have the uh, Labor History Symposium that's named after Walter Ruther and Augustus Pollock. So we have a worker, a union guy, and an owner. So that's the conclusion. I'll bring Hal back out in case there are any questions. I have this letter up here if you want to see it close with his signature. Thanks, Hal. Questions? Did you say there are descendants of someone here? Is yeah. You want to introduce yourself? Hi. Yeah, it's my great great grandfather. And now, I'm going to object my sister, I believe, is watching this on Facebook. I said, um, <laughs> uh, 
uh, through our grandmother, Josephine Jefferson. So my male visual is Steve Okay, and so Augustus had one son and six daughters, so you're a descendant of one of the daughters? Well, Jerry, the, um, the son was Josephine's. I'm not sure. Oh, okay. <laughs> We're going to look into it. And don't think it's from the daughter. I thought it was from the son. I prefer my sister's dying in California. <laughs> <laughs> and are there other descendants other than your sister? You and your sister? Yes, we have a cousin in Florida, uh, Mark Jefferson. And that's, that's it? Yeah, well, yeah, but everyone else is dead. <laughs> that's the least that I'm aware of. Uh, we had two uncles and uh, a descendants. My father, Joseph Jefferson, and his brother, Peter. Margaret Brennan. Um, Sean, did I read somewhere where the factory was the largest in the country or the world at one time? Or is that not true? I, I seem to remember reading that myself, but I, I can't confirm it. Largest stogie factory, largest maybe. Stogie. Not, not the largest factory, of course, because steel mills would have been much larger. Was <coughs> it? I, I don't know. Not sure. Not sure. Not sure. Chaplin Street at one time? Yes, yeah, Chaplin Street at one time. I mean, for a period of time, he was living in this in the notion with the store that he owned on Main Street there as well. The notion stopped. They, they were basically living upstairs, and the store was on the lower level. And as I said, I told Sean, it looked like the location is roughly like where that parking lot is next near the, the, the truest BB bank branch. So that would have been roughly, which is, it makes sense because the, then later the factory. Would have been behind a water stream right there. But a lot of that's gone. Yeah, yeah. Many years, so. yeah with seven kids, we didn't have to so. Yeah. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, are there any other examples of this kind of leadership, shall we say? Uh, can you think of anyone else who was this influential as far as being? Helpful to the workers. Wow. So he truly was. I can't think of anybody. Not, not, not to this wheel. degree. The Block family. Yeah, I would. I probably the Block family. I would probably say because they, they, they had, yeah, they had decent labor relations as well. But anybody in like the harder industries, coal, steel, glass. Well, just Block is known as being. Sure. Uh, yeah. yeah, and I think that's why they ended up getting. But that would have been. Later. Later, yeah. Given the time and you made this point of the other robber parents, that would have made him really an outlier from the, the norm of how business was practiced back then. Sure. And it's it's amazing that through the will of, from his personality that he was so well regarded by it seems like the business community as well, given his board relationships and yeah. their business community. Well, I, I think what I, having looked at a lot of that period of his life, what you see in the articles is very clearly they pro they respect him because he, he makes money. I mean, he is like them. I mean, he's not to make money. He's very successful. Right. But there there is this kind of distinction that if you read stories, it's often a lot of times like workers going to his house during the political rally and come and speak, come out and speak, come out and speak. It's not like he's going out to a country club or he's going out to some you know, place where he's just interacting in that business environment. He, he has this sort of cross-class group of friendships. I think his ties to the German community as well, that, that's, he's very much tied to that group of business owners who are German, whereas I don't usually see a lot of that interaction with some of those sort of non-German. I, I haven't seen it. Right. And how, remind me, how old was he when he came to the 
So he first came, he was about 19 years old. He comes to Wheeling, mid 1850s, so it would have been in his mid 20s or so. So was, was he alone, or did his whole family come, or did he go? He was alone initially. When he comes back the second time, he's obviously married by that point, so he's coming as a family. I think, I think initially, you know, like many immigrants, he's starting out in that Baltimore port where there's a large German Jewish population. A lot of the bigger business establishments there would often support someone who would go out to an outline, particularly in the upper real high river route. Cincinnati had a pretty large German Jewish population, Pittsburgh, Wheeling. Um, and then, you know, he kind of almost wants to go to Grafton when the B&O sets it up as a, a roundhouse depot, but then kind of settles again on, on Wheeling. The one thing I had trouble finding a lot on is his relationship with the Jewish community itself. So he was Jewish? He was Jewish, but I, I, I didn't find a whole lot of articles about his involvement with the, the synagogue, the temple. You know, it's just kind of that. It's, it's, it's hardly ever bit, mentioned him. Yeah. It's a little bit of a line. We were always told that he was Yes. Yeah, the only time it does come up is when they built the big synagogue in, in downtown Wheeling. That's when you do see some, yeah. some mention of it. But, you know, and, and, that's, and that's unique as well because the, the, you know, that German Jewish community in Wheeling tended to be a little more on the progressive side of politics, labor relations, and many other things. So. Well, question. And it's not a question, it's a comment. Uh, the guy that owns Jerome Yogurt kind of has that. Thing where I've read articles where he gives his employees bonuses and raises, and he's an immigrant from Turkey when he started with that. So every time you talk about him, I keep thinking about him. Like he's a good example because in this world right now, it's not about the employee; it's about profit. So it's kind of interesting that to the Turkey immigrant to uh, yeah. to his employees. That's interesting. Has there ever been talk uh, of uh, the, the uh, historian who does the series for public public television uh, on Augustus? Hmm. I've not heard. His birthday to Ken Burns. Oh, yeah. Burn. I don't know. No, not that I'm aware of. No. I mean, he's a fascinating figure, but he hasn't gotten a lot of national attention, as far as I know. He should. Maybe that would do it. That would do it, yeah. <laughs> Ken Burns came here and did a documentary. That would do it. He could, he could cover, you know, wheeling business. Yeah. Ken Burns, if you're listening, <laughs> get Hal Dorby working on that. <laughs> Any others? Thanks, everyone.